All right, guys, it's uh, time for us to get started. Good to see everybody, and we have some other things planned before the night. I say we, I mean Seth and Dee, have some other things planned uh, for this evening, and we've gotten a little late to start, uh, and we don't want to take away from other things we have planned uh, for tonight. So let's turn our attention to the subject that we have for this lecture, and that is edification. Uh, the word is going to be addressed, the meaning of the word I believe is going to be addressed with every one of these lectures, uh, so we'll go through that uh, a little bit quickly and, and uh, look forward to that being addressed in, uh, in the lectures tomorrow as well. I want to focus on looking at what edification is and how it comes about and what edification is not. And then we're going to take a look at some things that distract us from edification, that hinder it, that keep edification from taking place. So that's what we're going to look at tonight, and tonight's is more of a uh, lecture format where I get to talk and you don't get to interrupt. <laughs> and tomorrow there's going to be some more interactive uh, sessions, and, and that would be good uh, as well. Um, Open your Bible, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. I want to start uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 through 16. I don't know if I'll read all the way through 16 or not, but this, this is a passage I keep coming back to the last several years as I've been studying uh, the Scriptures and thinking about the church and God's purpose for the church, uh, what the church is supposed to accomplish, Ephesians chapter 4 speaks to this very well and very clearly. Uh, let's read verses 11 through 16. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love. And remember that phrase. We'll come back to it. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ from whom, every, or from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. In my translation uh, that I'm reading from, the New King James Version, the word edify shows up in, two, uh, in, in one form or another at least twice in this passage. So it is speaking to our subject. Uh, God has given the local church three primary uh, tasks or three primary works to be done. Evangelism, edification, and benevolence. Perhaps you've heard these before. This weekend we're going to be looking at edification and what edification is. And since it is something the church is supposed to do, we need to know what it is. In the outline that you have, I've uh, put some definitions there for the words edify and edification. I've put them first in English uh, because I speak English. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm very fluent in redneck. <laughs> I'm, I'm still trying to get English down. Uh, but English is our primary language. I'm, I've got to tell you, this is a little, little sidebar. I think the best Bible study tool that you can have other than your Bible is a good English dictionary. You need to know what the words mean in your language, in our language. Uh, in my study, other than my Bibles, the book that is closest to me, I can turn around and grab my English dictionary, and I use it quite often. Um, so I just, I give you that, uh, some free advice, and probably worth what, what you pay for it, free. But an English dictionary will help you as you're studying the Bible. The word edify comes from an old French word, uh, edifier, and it means to build or to construct. And that was the primary meaning, to physically build. It's interesting when you look at the words edify and edification, 
in our modern English usage, the word edify means to instruct. Especially to instruct or improve morally or spiritually. The word edification is defined as an edifying or being edified. Instruction, especially moral or spiritual instruction or improvement. So when I look at these two definitions, the word that stands out to me is instruction. When we're talking about edification, we're talking about the result of the process of instruction. And we need to pay attention to that. When we come to the Greek word, uh, the Greek word that is translated edify in its different forms in the New Testament uh, literally means to build, referred to the building of a house. But again, it is used uh, in the Scriptures uh, to refer to the sense of spiritual growth, promoting spiritual growth and development of character of believers by teaching or by example, suggesting such spiritual progress as the result of patient labor. And that's W.E. Vine's definition uh, to this Greek word. So again, emphasis is placed on teaching, uh, instruction. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about edification. We're talking about the result of teaching or instruction. And I noticed something in, in studying for this lecture. The English Standard Version, I don't know if any of you are using that translation or, or not, that version. The English Standard Version does not use the word edify or edification. It always translates the Greek word with its meaning, to build up. So you may read in your Bible, I don't find the word edify, edification anywhere. Uh, they give the literal meaning of the word in their translation, to build up or to build. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 4. We'll look at this verse as we consider the next point in the outline. And that is the fact that we can be built up or we can be edified individually as, as individual Christians, and we can also be built up or edified collectively as a local congregation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 4 speaks to this, uh, talking about the, those who would speak in tongues, who would exercise that miraculous gift in the assemblies of the church. It says, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Notice here, edification is, is being done, but in one case, only one individual is being edified, and in the other case, the entire church is being edified. And this is addressing uh, the need for, in the assembly, the entire church to be edified, but it's a good passage to look at to see it can happen uh, both individually. That is, we can pursue edification on our own. We can do that as individual Christians, but God has formed the local church and has put us together in such a way that we can edify one another and we can be edified together as a church. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 31, it says that after the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, that the churches throughout Judea were at peace and they were built up or edified. And so the church can be built up, the individual Christian can be built up. Now, what is edification? What edification is and what it is not. Edification is the growing or building up of the moral character of believers through instruction. And as we look at the different definitions, both the English and the, the Greek as well, I believe this is an, a, an appropriate understanding, uh, an accurate understanding of what edification is. That's what we're talking about. Building ourselves up spiritually, uh, the moral character of believers through instruction. This is a rational process in which the mind learns truths that shape and develop our beliefs, our morals, and our characters. Edification should not be misunderstood as or confused with emotionalism. Getting excited. <clears throat> That's good that we can get together with other Christians and we can be excited. And we can walk away from such a gathering being excited. But that excitement should not be understood or, or misunderstood as edification. Now, emotion has its place in our worship. And emotion has its place in our service to the Lord. 
Uh, we can find this in many different passages, especially in the Psalms. Uh, personally, I've spent a lot of time in this past calendar year studying from the Psalms. And it's interesting to see how many emotions are brought up in the Psalms. Uh, we can rejoice. We can be glad. We can also feel sorrow. And this is appropriate. This is fitting in our worship services. Aren't there times in our worship service where it's appropriate for us to be solemn and to have our hearts pricked by thinking about the crucifixion of our Lord? That's an emotional response and that's appropriate. Or if someone comes forward and obeys the Gospel, shouldn't we rejoice? Yes, we should. So that's, that's an appropriate emotion for us to feel, uh, for us to experience. But that's not edification. We shouldn't misunderstand that as, as what the Scriptures teach edification is. Just because we have a strong feeling or an emotional uh, response doesn't mean we have been edified in the biblical sense. Edification takes place when God's Word is taught. I want to look at some passages with this point. The first is in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. Acts chapter 20 and at verse 32, Paul is addressing the Ephesian elders. As far as he knows, this is the last time that he'll see them. So he's giving them a farewell address. What would you say to elders if it was the last time you had an opportunity? Well, Acts chapter 20 tells us what Paul would say, uh, or what he did say to the elders in Ephesus. Verse 32, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up, and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What is edification? It's building up. Now what is it that brings about that, that building up? What is it that's able to build us up? Paul says it's the Word of His grace. It's God's Word that is able to build us up. Edification takes place when God's Word is taught. Um, looking at 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 <coughs> In verse 26, it's interesting when you look at the subject of edification, how often it comes up in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. A passage that discusses the worship assembly of the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and at verse 26, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation? Let all things be done for what? for edification or for building up. This is before the New Testament was written and compiled. And so the churches in the first century had members who had the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, some of them mentioned here. Whenever they assembled together, they were to exercise these gifts. And it was through the exercising of these gifts that God's Word was taught. It was taught through the singing that they did the singing of the psalms, uh, through the teaching that was done, through the, the, the speaking in tongues and the interpretation, uh, the revelation uh, of God's will. Uh, all of this was to be done, and the result of it was to be edification. So edification took place in the church whenever God's Word was taught. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, we read that passage as we began. I want to go back and look at it again, because... Edification is a, a primary theme in this passage. And it begins in verse 11. It says, And He Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. We have five here mentioned here, two of which no longer exist on this earth. The apostles are no more. When John died, that was the last apostle. Uh, the prophets, that was one who had the, the gift of prophecy. That was one of the miraculous gifts passed on through the laying on of the hands of the apostles. So when the apostles died, the generation after them, there were no more prophets. But it says that Christ has given some, given some to be apostles and some to be prophets to the church. Those individuals no longer exist, but what they contributed, we still have. It was through their work that the New Testament was revealed. And so the Lord has given apostles and prophets to the church today, 
It's through the New Testament. So we have the Scriptures. We have the Word that has been revealed through these men. We have evangelists or preachers of the Gospel. We have pastors. And that word is used in the New Testament to refer to elders. And elders are to feed the flock, to feed them God's Word. And we have teachers, those who would teach. Notice, all five of these that are mentioned, they're all connected with instruction, aren't they? All of them are connected with instructing the word, the church, the Word of God. Instructing them in the Word of God. And you go to the next verse, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You look at denominationalism today, we don't need to bash churches, but we can make observations. You look at some denominational churches today, and they have a, they have a list of people that are on their staff that are involved in all kinds of things that aren't spiritual. Uh, they have uh, people that coordinate their activities and their recreation and things like that. That doesn't result in edification. Because the Lord didn't give the church recreation directors. Didn't give them uh, these individuals who uh, could focus on these physical activities. That, that tells us that that doesn't produce edification. What produces edification is the instruction of God's Word. So edification takes place when the church assembles for Bible class. And if we miss Bible class, we've missed a period of edification. When we assemble together and someone preaches the Gospel, that's an opportunity for us to be edified. Gospel meetings that take place. I hope you're in the habit of attending every service in a Gospel meeting where you attend. Because that's an opportunity, additional opportunities, not just to spread the Gospel to the lost, but also for the members of every, uh, of every member of the congregation to be edified as well. Ladies classes that take place, uh, men's Bible studies that would take place, uh, vacation Bible schools and other things like that if, uh, where you attend have these different opportunities. Those are opportunities to be edified. And we need to take advantage of those. But we pointed out edification not only happens collectively, but it also happens individually. Do I have to wait for the church to assemble and have a Bible class before I can instruct myself in God's Word? Not at all. When we open up the Bible and we read it on our own, and, and we commit ourselves to daily Bible reading, be a DBR, daily Bible reader. I challenge you, the New Year's coming up, Make some New Year's res resolutions, right? Those things you forget about by the middle of January, right? Well, make one this year that you're going to read your Bible every day. Be a DBR, daily Bible reader. That's going to result in edification. The more time we spend studying God's Word, reading God's Word, meditating on God's Word, uh, that private time that we spend as individuals with the Bible, that will result in edification as well. So, we're going to discuss uh, some more aspects of this, no doubt tomorrow, in the lectures that come up. But I, I wanted, to, wanted to include that. What edification is and what it is not. Because sometimes we can get sidetracked uh, away from that. We, we get excited about things. And we may think, well, we're being edified, we're being built up. If we haven't been instructed in the Word of God, we haven't been edified in the biblical sense, so let's, uh, let's remember that as we go forward. Now, I want to address for a few moments some things that distract or hinder or keep edification from taking place either individually that keep me from being edified or some things that, that I can do that would keep someone else from being edified. And the Bible actually addresses some of these matters. Since edification is a part of the work of the church, it's important that it takes place. And wouldn't it be terrible to find out that I've actually been distracting from that? I've been keeping that from happening instead of co contributing to that taking place. So I need to know about these things. What are some things that can keep edification from taking place first? And the first three we're going to look at come from the book of 1 Corinthians. And they had some problems in Corinth. 
Uh, and these problems were keeping the church from being edified. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, in verse 1, we see that a lack of love will result in a, a lack of edification, or will keep edification from taking place. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and at verse 1, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. I do like the way the English Standard Version renders this phrase. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I like that. Knowledge can make us arrogant. I know something that you don't know. Or I know better than you know. And I know that it's okay to do this and, and you don't understand that yet. And so I've come along a lot further than you have. And having this kind of knowledge can create an attitude where I'm better than you. And can't you tell when someone has that attitude towards you? When someone thinks that they're better than you, if you haven't been able to pick that up yet, you will someday. You'll meet somebody like that someday. Someone like that going to be able to edify you? No. It's going to keep that from taking place. And that's what Paul says here. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Love edifies. It's important that we have a knowledge of the truth. I'm, I'm not going to sell that short at all. It's essential that we have a knowledge of the truth. But can't we handle the truth in an ungodly way? We certainly can. We can be guilty of having the truth and yet holding it or using it or defending it in a way that does more harm than good. Life-saving medicine should not be administered in a harsh manner. I understand that back when the polio vaccine first came out that the medicine was put on sugar cubes and people took the medicine by eating the sugar cube. Wouldn't you much rather eat a sugar cube than get a shot with a big long rusty needle with about three prongs on it <laughs> by someone that just stick you and say, Next! We don't have to administer the truth in the harshest way possible. We need to practice love. If we truly love someone, and I mean that 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love, we're going to seek out their best interest. So we're going to do what we can to, to help them. Love will create and love will sustain an environment in which edification can truly take place. Remember, we read in Ephesians 4 verse 15 that we are to speak the truth in love. And there's one of those areas where Christians have to learn how to balance. Uh, a lot of what I find in the Scriptures is a challenge in that we have to balance between two different things, two different responsibilities. Uh, and here we have to speak the truth. But we have to be careful to do it in love. So we have to learn that. A lack of love can destroy edification. Second, if we go down to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, selfishness can destroy or hinder edification from taking place. And here I'm thinking primarily about me being able to contribute to you being edified. If I show up in the worship service, if I show up in the assemblies of the church and Bible class, and the only person I'm thinking about is me, and what I'm going to get out of this class, what I'm going to get out of worship today, am I going to contribute to anyone's edification? Not at all. I'm only thinking about myself. That's the problem that Paul was addressing in 1 Corinthians chapters 8, 9, and 10. People who were only thinking about themselves. And they were running roughshod over their brethren in order to, to exercise their own liberties or, or their own, their own uh, desires, uh, their, the things that they thought that they could do. In 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 24, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Now, as, reading, as you're reading this passage, you need to understand that this phrase, all things, used in an accommodative way. 
Paul isn't saying that every possible thing is lawful for me to do because there are sins. There are some things that are sinful. What Paul is saying is that everything that is lawful for me to do, I can do. But it's not always going to be the most helpful thing if I do it. Everything that is lawful for me, I have a right to do, but it's not always going to result in my brother's edification every time. And I need to understand that. I need to be thinking about someone other than just myself. I need to be thinking about my brethren. In verse 24, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. A good passage that goes along with that is Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Is it okay for me to be concerned about my interest? It is okay. I can think of my own interest, but not above someone else's. I need to be thinking about others as well. And then it goes into verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. What mind? The mind of putting others first. Because if Jesus didn't do that, would He have come to the cross? Not at all. He did that not for Himself. He did that for us. And we need to follow that example. Uh, desiring the spiritual benefit and edification of ourselves and of others is a hallmark of Christian maturity. When we assemble ourselves together, we need to be thinking about one another and how we can exhort one another and stir one another on to love and to good works. Selfishness will ruin the opportunity for edification. There's a third thing I see in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 17. Something that can hinder or destroy edification from taking place. And that is confusion or distractions in the assembly. How well do you follow along with what the preacher is saying when the person in front of you is moving a lot and making a lot of noise. It's hard to do. It's not impossible. Some people can do it and get that tunnel vision and they can just focus in and, and, uh, and cast out everything out, block out everything else. Uh, but God understands that's not always easy for everyone to do. The things that would occur in an assembly that would distract us from being able to receive instruction it's going to hinder edification. Because remember, edification is instruction, the result of instruction. So the preacher gets up and he can't really talk very well. And if you can't hear the preacher, can you receive instruction? No, he needs to speak up. We need that sound system working. Uh, and, and we need to be able to hear. Or if the preacher gets up and he starts quoting the Greek and talking about the Greek and, and, and how the Greek words all go together and, and that sermon goes right over our heads as edification taking place. No, I swim in the shallow end of the pool. <laughs> You're going to have to keep it simple for me in order to, to catch on and to follow along. Uh, so talking over someone's head is, is going to keep edification from taking place. But also the distractions that go on. And this, is where, this is where you and I uh, as members sitting in the pew. Uh, we owe it to our brethren and those around about us to be as respectful as we can and to be as quiet and as still as we can. Emergencies happen. There are times that babies are going to fuss uh, or that we've got to get up and take care of things. But I don't know about where you worship, but I, I've been some places where there's a potty parade <laughs> through the worship service. And it's usually the same people that get up and, and go to the bathroom. And, you know, some, sometimes nature calls, and sometimes it calls every week. Uh, I, I can't, I, I don't know uh, what's going on in, in the hearts and minds of some people. But let, let's not contribute to unnecessary interruptions or distractions. Uh, because that, that does interfere with the learning process and what's going on around about us. In 1 Corinthians 14, the Apostle Paul is talking to uh, 
the members there who had the gift of tongues and they were enamored with the gift of tongues and they wanted to speak in tongues, but the problem was no one understood what they were saying. And if no one understood what they were saying, there was no instruction. And if there's no instruction, then there's no edification. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 17, For indeed, uh, for you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Why are they not edified? Because they haven't understood what you've said. And it's not just speaking in another language that can keep someone from understanding what is said. It's uh, not speaking loud enough, speaking over someone's head, being distracted, all the things that we've talked about. Uh, these things can keep people from hearing and receiving instruction. So uh, let's remember when we're in the assemblies of the church or in Bible class, let's be as respectful as we can uh, because teaching is being done edification is taking place and we don't want to hinder that. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 we read of something else that can keep edification from taking place. Edification requires more than just instruction. It has to be instruction in the Word of God. The truth has to be taught and so when different or strange doctrines are being taught People are not being edified. Edification is not taking place. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Here's some things that can happen. Uh, here's some behaviors that can take place. And Paul says it's going to result in disputes. It's going to result in arguments. It's going to result in conflict instead of edification. Later in the same book, in chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Now let's back up to verse, uh, yeah, yeah, start at verse 3. I focused in on five and I passed over three. Verses three through five. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Some translations don't have this last phrase, but others do. I believe it belongs. It says, from such withdraw yourself. These people are distracted. They're keeping edification from taking place. You withdraw yourself from them. This is written to Timothy as a young evangelist you don't have time to get caught up in these things. People want to talk to you about fables and myths and endless genealogies and chasing arguments that go down uh, a, rabbit, a rabbit trail. You don't have time to get caught up in that because that doesn't result in edification. You know, as, as a country, we are a democratic country where everybody has a voice and every voice needs to be heard. Isn't that kind of the premise upon which our country operates? Uh, ideally, yes, it is. That's not the case in the Lord's church. The Lord's church is not an open forum where every theory and idea can be addressed or, or can, be, can be taught, can be rehearsed. No, in the assemblies of the local church, only the truth of God's Word is to be allowed to be taught. Anything else results in division, arguments, contention. Anything results in everything except for edification. So we need to make sure that we're teaching the truth, that we're demanding that the truth and only the truth be taught. There's one more thing that I see. If you look to Mark chapter 4, we're going to look at the parable of the sower. One more thing that I can see that will keep edification from taking place individually. I see this primarily. We looked at the others as when we come together as a church and, and there's distractions, there's, there's selfishness, there's a lack of love, the false doctrine being taught. This one 
primarily looks at, at you and I individually. And something that will hinder or keep uh, edification uh, from taking place individually. Uh, you remember the parable of the sower. Uh, there were four different kinds of soil. Remember, there's the wayside ground that was hard and the, the seed wasn't taken in. There was the stony ground, which the, the ground was real thin and the seed sprang up quickly and then died very quickly. There was no depth there. This is that third ground. It's the thorny ground I want us to consider. And then there's the good ground uh, that, re that produces a, a, a bountiful harvest. As Jesus is explaining these different kinds of hearts, Mark chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, it says, Now, these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. I used to have a computer that didn't have a lot of memory. And if you opened up too many programs at one time, guess what? That thing went slower than these buggies we were trying to pass <laughs> as, we were, as we were making our way here. You know, we all operate that way. There's only so much room that we have in our heart, in our mind. There's only so much space there. And God's Word cannot grow, it cannot thrive, it cannot be fruitful in a crowded heart. One thing that is going to keep us from being edified individually is if we allow anything and everything to come in, take place in our heart, and use up our time, and use up our resources, and use up our energy, so that we don't have anything left to give to God's Word. Mark, and the reason I went to Mark's account is because he mentions three things. The cares of the world, that would be the, the anxieties, the worries that we have of, of everyday life. The more time we spend focusing on that, the less time we have to spend thinking about God's Word. The deceitfulness of riches. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9-11, through 11, Paul talks to Timothy about the love of money and how dangerous that is. And we can get caught up in that in our, our world if we're not careful. Chasing after riches, chasing after things. And then the desire for other things is included here. And that would be the pleasures of life. The, the things uh, of, of this world that perhaps aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves, but if we put anything above God, have we not made it bad? We certainly have. God has to come first. So the crowded heart. That's what I call the, the thorny ground. That's the crowded heart. That's the heart that has so many things in it, there's not enough room left to operate and function God's program. To, to read and to study, and to meditate upon, and to live God's Word. So perhaps we need to clean house. Perhaps we need to get some things out of our life. And again, we're coming up on that time of the year where we can make those resolutions. And we can, if we've got this crowded heart, we can do some house cleaning. We can get some things out that, that aren't needed and that actually are, are taking away from uh, edification taking place. So here's some things that really truly can keep edification from happening. And what a shame it would be to find out that we're actually causing edification from taking place. It's God's will that each and every one of us as His children grow and stand strong in the faith. And edification is the means by which this takes place. We grow, we develop, we strengthen, we mature spiritually. And as this weekend continues, we go into tomorrow, we're going to have opportunity to continue to talk about this and, and uh, we'll have opportunity even tonight. And I'd be glad to talk with, with any one of you if you would like to. We can continue to discuss this, talk about the need for edification and talk about some ways specifically in which edification can take place. And hopefully as we leave from this uh, weekend, we'll have a better understanding of this subject, we'll have a greater desire to contribute to it. That's all that I have.